Oh, it's just a great honor for me to be here. I think, um, you know, the quality of care and surgery that's done here is, is as good as anywhere in the world. So it really is a great honor for me to be here. Financial disclosures, I do get paid to Proctor by Intuitive. Many, many of you know I wrote a book. Uh, a lot of you have read this, and I appreciate that. We now have several uh, residency programs in the United States that are making this mandatory reading for their residents and cardiothoracic fellows. So I appreciate that. I think I get a dollar and three cents if you buy the book. So the lawyers at UAB said I have to declare this as a conflict. <laughs> and I got my first check in the mail for I think we sold like 2,000 books. And my kids were all excited. We opened it up and it was for $420. And my son is like, where's the money? I said, that's it, brother. There's no money in writing a book. But uh, I have to declare it anyhow. So. I do want to reduce this to philosophy. If we believe that minimally invasive surgery is better patient care, that they have less morbidity, less mortality, less blood loss, and if you think better care saves money in the long run, and you just heard very eloquently from Dr. Khan as to why, and that is correct. And it's not just the metrics of how quickly they're in the operating room, the short metrics of getting out of the OR, but also measure of quality, readmission, pain, back to work, and societal costs then the robot is the easiest cell in the world. It's a no-brainer that you should do everything robotically despite the initial capital cost and despite the consumable costs. But it comes down to quality. And what would you do for your mom? Well, if you wanna do that for your mom, then you do that for the patient who lives under the bridge in Birmingham and doesn't have a home. And I do that and we lose some money. And I just looked at my 2014 numbers. I just did this actually last night. Uh, I did 97 lobes because I normally do about 120, but I've been traveling so much my numbers are down. I did 90 of the 97 robotically, including the two sleeves that I did, uh, I did robotically. The one on the left side we converted because there was invasion of the pulmonary artery. And as you said, Arvid, I agree that was a reason for me to open. Although there is a robotic surgeon who's done a pulmonary arterioplasty robotically actually in New York. And all my esophagectomies were done robotically, all of them. So really my practice is all robotic. And the question is why? If you're a very good VAT surgeon, or you're a very good laparoscopic surgeon, or you're very busy doing thoracotomy, I think the answer is, well, you've heard the robot costs more. You've heard it's hard to learn. You've heard there's docking issues and all these other issues. But at the bottom line is the patient's overall outcome is better. You probably should do it. And here are my results now, and, and I'm glad to say that I have done more robots than anybody in the world in thoracic surgery. Intuitive has these numbers for the distributed ships in Italy and everywhere, and I've done more than anybody. So I can say I got the world's largest experience, but yet I need to get better. I want to get better every day, and when I sit here and listen to experts speak, it makes me think of things I can do to get better. So I appreciate that. That's, that's my privilege to come and to learn. We've done over 300 mediastinal tumors, 85 Ivor Lewis's, and our mortality is zero there. And what I'm most proud of is that our mortality for about 500 lobectomies is now one patient. So it's 0 .00205 or 0.21%. And if you would have told me I could have got lobectomy mortality under 1%, I wouldn't have believed it. This is not anything to do with skill of the surgeon. This is to do with a great team. We have an incredible team in the OR and post-op. But the robot has made us completely portal, and that has decreased our inflammatory response. And we're pumping in warm, humidified air that matters. But our esophagectomy data is not so good. But that's our real number, 4.2%. I'm embarrassed with that, but that's where we are right now. Most of these were from liver failure. What people don't talk about is cancer. And although our follow-up is immature and infantile at 28 months, Look at the survival rates and the disease-free survival with the robot. It's unbelievable. If I go to show this at the AATS or the STS, they're going to crucify me because they're going to say, now Sir Folio is saying the robot is better for cancer. And I'm not saying that, but I'm willing to suggest that it might be. And I think the reason it might be is you stage the patient better you, by getting a better lymph nodes. You lose less blood. Our transfusion rate is zero. We don't even type and screen or type and cross the patients anymore. We haven't done that for 10 years, but we don't need to do it robotically, even for large 9 and 10 centimeter tumors. And because they're better staged, they have less inflammation, I think they're less likely to get metastatic disease. If you look at this, when my, when my data coordinator did this with me, 
and she told me that 72% were of my patients with N2 disease are alive. I did not believe her. I said, I don't believe you. <laughs> she said, well, it's your own data. I said, I don't care. I don't believe you. I want to see all 20, nearly 29 patients. I want you to call them all. I want to see them all back myself. Two, we couldn't, but they got CT scans. They were from, one's from a different country. One was from California. They had CT scans of the brain, chest, abdomen, uh, before I presented this, all of which were negative. And the reason is, these are a highly select group of N2, I think, because they have, you know, we're very liberal with media stenoscopy, EBUS and EUS, and uh, they were all negative on that, but positive on pathologic N2. So I'd be very careful over interpreting this data that the robot's going to give you a 70% three-year survival for N2. I don't want to say that. That would be irresponsible, especially with an N of 29, but it's provocative to look at this high survival. And so... The answer to the why question is that's why. <laughs> the long-term results seem to be better. The short-term results seem to be better. And as you do more and more and more, your costs come down. And it's complicated to look at costs. When people just talk about costs, they're really doing that in a vacuum of very short-term operative costs, which is a small part of the picture. It's really what's the cost of society. And, you know, it's what you believe in and don't believe in. And it's a philosophy that I've mentioned with my kids. You know, I send my kids to private school. That costs me more money. I don't have a prospective randomized trial to show you that that's going to help them better than a good public school. It might not. It comes down to the kid. But I believe it makes sense. And I believe that a robotic approach is going to make sense and it has value, even though it's hard to prove the value, as you guys have eloquently said. So team is the key. I think I'll, I'll finish with this slide and just get to the video of the sleeve. This is a picture of my youngest son's bedroom. And I took this right before I left to come to India because this kid has a problem. He is sloppy. Here is his bedroom. Uh, here's a picture of his mirror, but it reflects the messiness in his brain. These are sneakers that are three years old. They don't even fit him, and yet they're still in his room. Here's a batting helmet. You know, he plays baseball <coughs> from two years ago. Doesn't fit him, but there it is sitting on his carpet. Clothes everywhere. This shows a disorganized man, a disorganized man. Yet in the chaos is some goal setting. He wants to go to an Ivy League. You know, my older son went to Yale. He's being recruited by Harvard and Yale. He wants to win more rings than a famous baseball player named Derek Jeter, who's a famous New York Yankee. And he wants to meet a woman like his mother. Well, good luck to him because that's not going to happen. But at least he sets some goals in this in this very disorganized mind there's goal setting and I submit to you as surgeons that's what we're like when we start robotics there's a lot of confusion there's a lot of chaos there's lights going off blue lights the docking is hard especially with the SI compared to the XI and all these other issues but the reality is in that chaos in this incredible chaos there is goal setting and there is order and so now I'm going to show you the world's first robotic sleeve resection. Actually, it's the second. And this video, let me orient you because there, there's only been four of these done in the world, and I'm very proud to say I've done three of them. And, and the one surgeon who's done the fourth came down and spent a week with me, watched him, went up to New York City, Richard Lazario and did it, and he gets all the credit for doing it. But this is a patient. This is a right upper lobe. There's tumor right at the the distal right main stem and at the proximal bronchus intermedius. And so I've already taken the arteries and the veins off the right upper lobe. And I'm now going to cut the bronchus after I get all these N1 lymph nodes off. So everybody's oriented. Here's the right middle lobe. Here's the stump to the right upper lobe. And I just take these uh, scissors and cut. And I intentionally cut the right upper lobe bronchus I don't like when people say, oh, you need to do an on block. You don't know where to cut. So I think you look inside and you'll see tumor here. This was a big, bulky tumor. This was a seven centimeter tumor. And you can see there's cancer right here growing down. But it wasn't growing down so much on the membranous part. And you're going to see I did a tailored membrioplasty because that's the part of the airway that rips when you're doing the sleeve. So I have heard from many surgeons that you cannot use the robot for a sleeve, that a sleeve resection is an absolute contraindication to the robot. And, and here it is.
Has anybody else here done a sleeve? You have. How many have you done? So you've done two. This is great. We need to write a paper. Fantastic. We have five. And we'll get Richard. We'll have six. <laughs> so it's good. When did you do yours? Uh, last month. Last month. Gosh, see, Intuitive doesn't know this. They don't have that number. So here is the uh, left main stem. Here is now I'm in the inside the right up over. Now I'm looking, and I'm going to take this right main stem down to the carina. It's very important here that you've cleared off this number seven lymph node, the subcarinal node, which is right there. Your assistant should hold the right upper lobe pulmonary artery down. And now if you can tailor a flap out onto this main stem, that'll give you less tension when you sew this together. This is an important trick, which actually I do open. Now I see the extent of my tumor. Now I'm gonna cut the right main stem a little more proximally. I send off a frozen. Our initial frozen was positive, and I recut it to get a negative margin. This patient actually, all of his N2 nodes were, were um, negative, but he had several positive N1 nodes. Here we are, right on the carina. There's that lymph node that lives right in the carina between the right and left main stem. There's your sleeve being resected. Keep blood out of the airway. Make sure you keep your left balloon up. That goes for tumor markers and all genetics, of course. And now you're set up, and I do interrupted knots on the outside. So you're going to take a vicral suture. This is a 3-0 vicral on an RV needle. Knots on the outside. Sewing that right main stem. Remember, there's a size mismatch. I start on the cartilage. I don't think you should start in the membranous. I think you should sew that last. I think it's okay to run it. If you want to run parts of this, I think that's fine. One of the problems with running the vical is you can fray it. So I would rather do at least interrupt it here in the membranous part, you can run it. I think you get the idea of what's happening here. You line this up. Let's move this along a little bit. Tie your knots down away from the pulmonary artery. You want to make sure that these knots are out of the way and not rubbing on the PA. That's the posterior segmental artery, the right upper lobe that was stapled. Here's the anterior apical trunk of the right upper lobe. <laughs> You line this up, very, very simple. I prefer to use these, uh, these needle drivers that have scissors on them. It makes me much more efficient. Dr. Khan, you did a right sleeve or a left? You did a left, you did a left, left upper lobe sleeve. Very nice. Did your assistant use the sucker to hold the pulmonary artery down as you were sewing? That's an important part on the left. So that clunky needle, what suture did you use? Uh, PDS 3-0. Uh, 3-0 PDS, very good. And was that on a small needle? On a small needle. Yeah, I think that's very important. Of course, I don't sew quite that fast, but you get the idea. Hmm. Prof. John Min in China has done uh, three of them as well. Is that right? We need to get that data. They, they have a huge series of rats. Uh, yes. Uh, but, but bronchial yeah. sleeve as well as, as pulmonary artery. Yes. Arterial sleeve. Yeah. But, but robotics, Janmin has done three. Okay. I wonder who, uh, so there must be others out there that have done this. And it's probably. Intuitive logs these as lobectomies. <sighs> you know, it, it's a local. So I had them spend a month or two trying to get this from the distributors. And this is what they told me. Very interesting. It gets logged on the system as a lobectomy. Yeah, that, a that's system. a shame because it's obviously quite quite a different operation. Let's move this along. I want to show you because when I finished this, there was a leak. Typical surfolio didn't sew it well together. And you can see where, well, I'm not sure if this video has it, but the first one I did leaked. And then I like to turn and take robotic arm three and pin the lung back. And then you can just run the membranous very, very easily together. And you can just run this here. But I want to show you, um, I have one here that leaked. This was the first one I did. Let's see if you can sew it. So here I am using PDS to repair robotic arm three, which is a five millimeter lung grasper, holding up on the last suture. This is the right main stem, almost the trachea, to the bronchus intermedius. There's a superior segmental artery, the right lower lobe. And again, I think, you know, you can test for a leak. 
So you pour water in here. In this case, I had to divide the azygous vein. There was gross N2 disease, that for our lymph node. Look, and here's a bubble. So you're able to fix this robotically. And that is a 3.0 PDS on a small needle, which is what you used on yours. The first one we did, the patient went home on post-op day one because the patient was young. The other ones went home on post-operative day number two. So again, I think when people talk about, oh, is the cost of the robot worth it? I don't think that they're really looking at costs correctly. It's cost to society. It's cost of going back to work. It's not just your capital costs and your consumable costs. It's the overall cost of the patient and the family, which is very difficult to really quantify and requires statist complex statistical models to do it. I think for time's sake, I will shut up and would rather answer some questions. What, yes? Uh, we do, I, I also do vast thymectomy. I haven't done a robotic thymectomy. Uh -huh. uh, the only thing I notice, and this actually uh, is to Dr. Arvin, that what I have felt, and I looked at his video also very carefully, is that the cardiophrenic fat on the opposite side is yes. not accessible from one-sided approach. Uh, you can do everything else. You can get the phrenic nerve. But the fat which lies <coughs> in the opposite cardiophrenic region, that is very difficult. I mean, I, I have not ever been able to. If you put with, the scope on the other side. With VATS, you cannot get it. I, I but agree But even with, you. with robotic. No, I uh, think you can. I, I really honestly think you can. You can by having your assistant grab the thymus and pulling it through the access port and seeing the nerve and seeing it. Uh, not in everybody, but in most patients. Can I answer that? Please. Yeah. Uh, VATS definitely uh, from one side, yeah. you don't, you're blind to the other side. I agree. And that's why when I was doing VATS, actually Dr. Rajinder and myself, we are part of the team. Yes. We were in the same unit when I was at the Orlando Institute. And it's uh, very heartening that after I left the team, he's continued the VATS work there. Very good. So. When we used to do VATS there, the approach was always bilateral. Initial few, when I started in 1999 and 2000, right. I did from the right side, but then I had a problem with the left nerve. Correct. One. Then I went over to the le left side, but then I was not very comfortable. So we switched over to the bilateral. I would start from the left, yes. complete the dissection up to the midline from the left, right. and then come and complete the end. So the entire dissection on both the sides, including the blind area, that is the AP window on the left mm -hmm. and the aortico cable groove on the right. Yeah. Everything is under vision right. and you clear both the pericardial pads completely under vision. When we moved to robotics, there was this issue that whether we'll be able to get the right uh, fat from the left side. But the fact is, when you go down and if you just incise on the mediastinal pleura Correct. and keep moving right, 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 I you agree. actually will be able to get that uh, entire fat. I, I right agree. And, also. And I but there is a hang, hang on problem second. in getting the entire left fat I agree. from the right side. Hang on a second. Let's slow down. Let's yeah. slow down. Let's slow down. So I'm agreeing with him so much that when I first did my thymectomy to the left, I used to put a scope in the right side because I didn't think you could do it. And I found I was wasting my time. I was getting it all. So what he's saying is if you're on the left going to the right, you can get it. But when you're on the right going to the left, it can be more difficult, which is your next point. On which point. we take assistance from uh, another 5 millimeter port. Correct. Port because, you know, at the back of your mind, you're always worried about the phrenic. Yes. So what we do now when we are approaching from the right side and we need to clear the left, Dr. Bilal always puts a 5 millimeter telescope on the left side right. and is guiding me and telling me, okay, move further, move further, move yes. further. And I keep telling him when he's about, when I'm few millimeters from the nerve, right. he says, okay, that's your posterior most dissection. Don't go beyond. This so is a nice technique. complete removal without any possibility of injuring the nerve. Very good. Quick question with a quick answer. Uh, since you're in a position to uh, be an opinion uh, maker world over, so most of our videos that we see, like you, say, like you all mentioned, pearls lie in uh, port placement and docking. Yes. Somehow videos invariably start with the uh, only two phenomenal surgery, but there is never any time dedicated towards port next, placement next and docking. Talk is on port placement. So yes. Yours so is there here, but most online videos don't give you that, those pearls. So, so if you well, you know, and, and they should because port placement is everything, but port placement needs to come with explanations and understanding and team building. And so we will talk about this later. But I've moved my ports further and further down to over the top of the eighth rib for upper lobes and over the ninth rib for lower lobes.